recording. One, two, yes. three, four. Yeah, maybe it's on my side that it's doing that, and it's hearing itself, and it becomes an endless loop. Um, that's a bit odd. Just see what happens if I keep talking here for a moment, see if, uh, if it goes into a loop again, because that, that would not be so good. No, okay, but it's, it seems that it's recording, and how long did it take just now before this came through? Well, that, that loop? Yes. Yeah, it was 30 seconds or something. It wasn't that long before it started to... Because it's recorded 30, 40 seconds now. Okay. Um, well, we can give it a go and see what happens. Um, All right. <laughs> yeah. I spent half an hour just setting up this. Yeah, thing. just the technical challenge of getting the damn thing working. <sighs> okay. All right, let's have a go and see what happens. I mean, if it worse comes to worse, I'll, you know, maybe I'll go away and research if we can't get this working properly. But let's see, we're recording at the moment. So, do you want to do a welcome? Because this will go on your channel. Um, so, if you want to do a welcome and stuff and say a few words, and then we can get started. I thought we were going to put it on both. Say again? I thought we were going to put it on both. I might do. Um, I just get such a lot of negative feedback. There's very little. So at the moment, I'm keeping my channel for speakers corner videos. Oh, uh, the last okay. time I did one of these sort of things, I got so much negative feedback that I'm like, you know, it didn't seem like it was it was of any value um, on my channel <laughs> because, of course, all the Muslims hated it, uh, and that's the majority of the guys. Um, so I'll see. I mean, maybe I will, but definitely if it goes on yours, because you want to do it for the video of the week, or I might put it on my other channel. I've got a, sep a separate channel that I might put that on. Okay, you decide whatever you want. I'm going to put it on the gin and tonic show. I'm going to put yeah. it on the um, on the on the imam, which should, this will be on imam son. Yes, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. this is a commentary of of a debate. So yeah. Yeah, you're gonna to have to say stop. This phone won't stay on continuously. It just it just switches itself off. Even though I've got auto switch off to not not switch off, and I'm on power and everything here, um, and I've got the Skype open on my mobile phone. But after a while, the screen just goes black and it locks. Um, <laughs> so just say stop. Let's just see what happens and yeah, you know, do the best. All we right. Can. Cool. Let's go. Okay, hi everybody. We're listening to Beyond the Stalemate of Cosmology and giving a running comment, or trying to. Welcome to, to, to this impromptu thing that we try to set up. Um, we're looking at a video by Yev Dawa, and we, this, this is just the, the, the two of us, and this is um, uh, the Hyde Park Specialist, um, the Hyde Park UK channel and it's Rob, and then it's me who is looking at this from the outside point of view. And this I declared to be the video of the week because it was one of the worst videos I'd ever seen from an apologist side because it sort of covered all the weak spots, all the, the desperation that you can call, that, that, that you can find within Muslim apologists. And what we're going to do is we're going to run through this. Now, it's a very long video, okay? It's 45 minutes. And if we're going to go and talk about it and, and bit by bit by bit, it's going to take a bit of, time, bit of time. So don't expect here the usual quick attention spam accommodating quickie. This is going to be a little bit longer. So if you want to get involved in this, we're going to explain everything in detail. Um, just, just try and catch the attention of people and draw out the things that are being said and compare it to reality and then show what it is that is being done wrong here. Um, number one, to show people who are giving these these dawa things and, and these apologists to show what they're doing wrong, where they need to brush up, and then showing people who are being confronted by this to show not to be afraid, not to go and run away from this because 99% is just bullshitting. They're not, they're not doing anything that makes a lot of sense. A lot of this is just pretend. And this is what we're trying to show. So Rob is going to run the video because I cannot um, stream this into into the program. So he's going to run the video. And then when, when he has a comment, he's just going to stop. Or if I want to say something, I think I want to say something after every sentence because it's so bad. So then we're, we're just going to go and, and, and talk about this. All right, Rob, then take it away. This is from EF Dawa. It's called Beyond the Stalemate of Cosmology. And it says, as, as a description, Abbas and Hamza. Um, I think Hamza is the guy with the red beard, and Abbas is the guy with the, with the dark beard, who is a little bit smaller. 
speak with Rob from the Speaker's Corner UK about cause and effect, the double slit experiment. See link below. And then they give a link to some video, I suppose, which explains the double slit experiment. Now, I don't know why they do that. Because they are hopelessly ignorant. They don't understand what double slit actually means. They don't know anything about quantum physics. They've got no idea what they're talking about. And yet they do it with such fervor. It's, it's, it's amazing. Okay, but we're gonna <clears throat> we're gonna show what not to do and 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 what this is step by step. So, is there anything else you want to add? Otherwise, go for it. Right, let's rock and roll. with the Muslim thing, but the guy wasn't able to explain. No, no, I'm not an expert on it. I've got the basics. Basically, this guy was like this guy was like a Lawrence Krauss type guy that was here. Well, can I test something on you? Okay, so just that little intro there was me talking about a bus because I'd seen a video with a bus and a guy called Phil who was really an expert in cosmology. Uh, you can go look it up. It's on the EF Dawa channel somewhere and he's trying to explain to a bus about cosmology in depth like, you know, it would have been Lawrence Krauss. If I closed my eyes, I thought it was Lawrence Krauss talking and a bus kept interrupting him. So that's how this video kind of started here with that sort of thing. And now what Hamza's doing, he's going to, quote, test something against me, which I'm happy for him to go ahead and do. So I've been working, on, I, I do a lot of Christians, and um, I've been working on how, how to tackle you guys. Because you guys are on a logical, intellectual tent. Yeah? So, uh, so as it stands, what, what do you uh, accept as the truth? What is it you are on? Whoa, 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 stop, stop, stop. This is crazy. This is, okay, you mentioned this before, because there, there was a debate between, this is, the, I'm talking about the, the Carol Craig debate, between um, a physicist, a theoretical physicist, uh, Professor Carroll, and a Christian apologist, a Dr. Craig. Now, the, 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 main, the two main things that were pointed out to Dr. Craig, the Christian apologist, were that number one, he is using antiquated vocabulary. This is, you know, Aristotelian sort of vocabulary from, from 2,000 years ago, or two and a half thousand years ago. We, we, don't, we don't use that kind of language anymore. The second thing is that there, there are no definitions for any of this. So now for him to go and say, well, how do you understand truth or what is truth for you is, is a stupid question in my eyes because truth is completely variable because the people three, four, five thousand years ago that said earth is flat, they were not lying. For them, they were telling the truth. Because according to their knowledge, according to what, what was real for them, their reality was that Earth was flat. So you can't say that truth at the time was flat and today it is not and therefore it's absolute. It doesn't make sense. So we can see that truth is actually a useless word in this context. It's always because truth is what compares to reality or to logics. And you, you, you can't go and make an absolute definition of truth the way that Muslims are trying to do, which is why half their channels are called, you know, this to truth and, 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 and truth and all truth reveal. I mean, you know, and, and they are the biggest liars and this doesn't make sense. So I always object to the word truth. Yeah, and I probably would in the future as well. I saw a, a philosophical um, discussion on it and, and the the philosopher that was talking was basically saying truth is a very in-depth concept to go into from a philosophical point of view never mind a scientific point of view and you're absolutely right you know it's science is a is a is a changing field but it's always getting better and this is the thing that I often point out as well you know it's not suddenly like science is going to do a complete 180 or even if there is a you know quite big jump it's not like religion is going to come and fill the gap so all that's happening is we continually improving ourselves whereas these guys are looking for the gaps and that's where they want to plug in, you know, their beliefs or their views or whatever it is. Yeah. And, and maybe it's worth pointing out right now here. If, if we're looking at science, if we're looking at, at gods, they, they are opposed. They're opposites. There is no way that they can coexist. You can't meet in the middle somehow. Because a, a, a guy who is religious, who says, OK, I've got a god here and I believe that this god exists, he will look at something and then try and find reasons why this is correct in his point of view. 
Whereas in science, it's exactly the opposite thing. You go and look at things, and from there you deduce something. And then you, 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 you look at the um, substantiating factors, and if one of them, if one of them does not match, you throw the whole thing away. And in religions, it doesn't work. There you have the solution, and you're trying to find ways to justify it. So it's exactly the opposite. Absolutely right. They use a top-down approach. Science, science uses the bottom-up. So let's go and look out there and see what we find. We can put a hypothesis out, but they work with God. And so if anything doesn't match, then we'll toss that out instead of starting the opposite way around. Absolutely right. Cool. Are you exception to children's stars in universal all this business? What criteria, basically? Okay, so what do you accept? So I believe the universe, has the, the best science we have, which is there's an inflationary model of the universe. That Big Bang. Big Bang. Um, no, I've, no, 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 no. <laughs> you, okay, the, the problem with these guys is they have heard some, some words, some terms, some expressions, and then they, they, they've somehow added their own understanding of this but they don't know what they're talking about so the inflationary model is not Bing Bang I mean Big, Bing, <laughs> Big Bang just, just notifies the limit of what we can still perceive in other words there, there are limits to what we can detect now, all, all that science does it just detects things it observes things it goes and, and, and takes um, things and, and puts them together and then this then derives in a model and this model is then check tested and blah 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 what what he is talking about <laughs> is the big bang the, the big bang is actually absolutely it's, it's a stupid word and it was it was um, you know this this was uh, the, the good old Catholic guy anyway it doesn't matter but the thing is that the big bang the way that he understands it as the beginning of the universe is absolute nonsense because what you, Rob, what you said, the inflationary model, is exactly that. But he does not understand that. He says, I mean, I know some of the, the, the BGV theorem, they, they always say that, um, the they, they came up with this idea that the universe had a beginning, and that is not the case. They don't understand it. And I see this here. I see the same thing again. No, it is not that. Yeah. The cosmologists say, and Alan Guth is the leading cosmologist. And so Klaus is there, Sean Carroll's there, they're all the guys are there, and I, I just take a broad view of it. So we, we take a bit of peace here. Yeah, yeah. Like see that. what's what's what. So, because um, so, I'm just saying, well, don't need the Bible. No, you don't need the Bible. You don't need the Bible. No, no, no. Right. So you believe in the concept of cause and effect, yeah? Yes. So everything that begins to exist. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What is cause and effect? You see, now we're going into this Aristotelian cause and effect of the prime mover and all that bullshit. No, they, you need to understand what a cause is and you need to understand what an effect is. And, and what, what he is referring to, I think, this, this is what, what, what I suppose, is this thing that if, if you um, exert energy on an object, then it moves. Then this is the cause of the effect of the movement. But this is all that there is. So there is nothing else that causes something. And I don't think he understands what, what a cause is. I'm not sure if he is using it that way. Let's see, because um, I think, if I remember correctly, he's more using it to bring up, um, which, which will come up shortly, the Kalam cosmological argument, um, which is obviously, you know, if you run cause and effect all the way back to the beginning of the universe, then everything since the the uh, inflation of the universe would have been a cause and effect sort of deterministic view and so that's what he's trying to get to I think more from a philosophical point of view I think uh, we'll see as he, as he carries on okay I do understand that there's different types of causes, uh, mechanical and... Uh, okay, so this what I brought up here. I've never heard of mechanical cause. I went to look that up and I still don't see it online anywhere. There's yeah, four... but this is exactly what I was talking about. That's a, right. This is, I think, what he <laughs> thinks is a cause, is the mechanical cause, is, you know, it's, it's kinetic energy. I think what he's confusing here is it's, there's, there's, there's four causes. There's um, uh, matter, form, agent 
and purpose or end of purpose as I've got it written down here. So I think he's talking about a material cause, but he's called it mechanical. And I'm like, you know, I've never heard of that. But again, mm. this is the thing with Speaker's Corner. People can say things and, you know, if you're in a live conversation, I mean, you can take out your phone, but you're not going to do that all the time. So he said mechanical cause. I'm going, I've never heard of that. I've obviously heard of contingent and material causes, etc., but never mechanical. And, and when I looked online, there's no such thing that I'm aware of. Uh, yes. Be more specific, what do you mean? Uh, okay, by mechanical, I mean its effect is simultaneous with its existence. <laughs> Have you ever heard of that? <laughs> this does not make sense. This is gibberish. Yeah, I mean, cause and effect, you know, you will have a cause, then you'll have an effect. So this simultaneous cause and effect, I'm not sure where he's getting this from. I don't yeah. know if he's confusing quantum mechanics or something with this, but um, again, when he said this, I'm, at the time I was probably thinking, what is this simultaneous cause and effect? You know, I'm not a cosmologist or a particle physicist, so that's the problem. When they throw terms out like this, then I'm going, well, I'm not sure of that. I've not, not heard of that before. You mean it's contingent and material? Is that what you mean? Those two causes? But that's the, that's the Christian view of it, contingent and material, which basically means that if you, a Michelangelo was a contingent um, cause of the statue, but the marble was the material cause. So that Okay, so that that was the correct definition, and that's obviously what I got from uh, one of the scientists. You know, they they split up the cause. Um, exactly. So, but he's talking about mechanical, so I'm not sure. You know, I what, don't what think he understands it. I think for him is, you know, there's there's a person, and he is the cause of the phone. Let's just take the phone, their favorite. And okay, so yes, so you've got the the manufacturer is the is the uh, contingent cause, and the materials from which it's made is the material cause, and you put exactly. those two together. Yeah, yeah. That's how they no, no, I'm not saying that. I, I'm, I'm saying, for example, uh, an apple tree. Yeah, is the cause of apples. No, no, no. Wait, what? That? No, you're right. He does not know what causes. <laughs> Apple tree is the cause of apples. <laughs> oh, this is funny. <laughs> Yes, yes, broadly speaking, yeah, sure. Right. Obviously, there's water and photosynthesis. Yeah. Now, its effect is simultaneous with the apple tree's existence. What it does when you do things. Yeah, I, I'm not sure where he was going with this. You know, it's almost like he went, oh, but the tree kind of knows when to do apples. Kind of. <laughs> yeah. um, it causes apples. <laughs> I mean, you could broadly stretch the word cause out to say, okay, you know, it, it causes apples. It produces apples would be a better terminology than causes apples. I mean, nobody says a tree causes apple. We all, English language, would say a, an apple tree produces apples. Um, so I think he's... Uh, attempting to, you know, uh, what's the word? Um, play with the word cause. Yeah, I think he has to. Okay, but there's a tree first and then there's an apple. Yes. Yeah. 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 Meaning the cause of the apple is the tree. Yes. But the tree, the tree doesn't decide when it has an apple or not. Mm -hmm. Not enough to decide, no, but it will it will happen at some point. No, yeah. It's just not a conscious process. No, but the process is happening as the tree exists. Yes, over a it's period not a conscious of time. decision. No, not, not conscious as you and I understand. Exactly. Yeah. So like me, I have a daughter. Yeah. And, me too. And I'm the cause of my daughter. No, you're not. What is he talking about? He doesn't... Ah... Oh. You know, this is when you, uh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, let's go on a bit. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, yeah, okay. I don't oh, think I exist in place, I'm not involved. Rob, just a second. Does he not understand that he does not have to be around for her sperm to be around? Does, does, doesn't he know, has he never heard of artificial insemination? Okay, but I'll, I will take a different sort of view. I think what he's talking about is his own sperm. In other words, um, yes, of course, there could be other sperm, but I think what he's trying to get to here, I'm, I'm just sort of paraphrasing my understanding of it, and you can, you know, correct or, or, you know, shoot it down. That's fine. But I think what he's talking about is, okay, in order for his daughter to come into existence, it needed to be his sperm with presumably his partner, his wife's egg. That's like, but he's just not saying it in that way. It's kind of a bit of a roundabout, kind of a sloppy way of saying it, I guess. Yeah, if I'm being charitable. Say so again. It's, it's not the cause. The cause, the cause itself for the daughter is the fusion of two cells. 
Okay, so he's stretching it back to the cause before that. Um, again, I'm not sure uh, how this is relevant, really. I can't remember, you know, whether this part, how this is relevant to the discussion itself. But I think we'll get there in a second. But he's, okay. he, you're right, he's kind of stretching out cause, 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 and going more causes back than we need to. So the immediate cause or the, the last cause, like you say, would be, you know, the fusion of the sperm and the egg at the, the ovary type thing. But he's going further back and go, oh, well, you know, it's my sperm. Oh, well, you know, it's my, you know, having, you know, sex with my wife type of thing. So, again, I'm I'm guessing that's what he's attempting to talk about. But like you say, it's, it's going back more than one cause. Affect my course. Okay, you can use those terms, yeah. yeah. Or if, if I um, if I want to make an apple and blackberry crumble, yeah. If I make an apple and blackberry crumble, you're making me hungry now. Yeah. It wouldn't exist. Hold on, make a one. With custard? <laughs> it depends. If it's hot, oh. vanilla ice cream. Oh. If it's cold, oh my custard. god. Oh. Oh. <laughs> that apple and blackberry crumble oh, right. <laughs> wouldn't exist unless I caused it to exist, yeah. Okay, so this is definitely a confusion here. Yeah. Exactly. Well, um, so yes, but that's not the word we normally use. And he's talking specifically about uh, creation ex materia is the proper way of saying it. So basically, you know, the I agree to a point that the apple crumble wouldn't exist if he didn't, if he wasn't involved in its creation, which is meaning he's the contingent cause and the the constituents of the apple pie are the uh, material cause. And that's important later on. It might sound like we're splitting hairs, but that's important when we get further down on this video. Exactly. Because he's setting it up now that cause can be just about anything. Correct. That's the problem. It doesn't necessitate to exist because I exist. Sure. Yeah? So this is what we call a conscious cause. It's, it, it's, it's a cause yeah, that makes things but doesn't have to, have to basically. Not, not contingent, if you like. Yeah, yeah, okay. okay, well, obviously, uh, if you're doing a Blackberry crumble, the person doing it is contingent. It's not going to make itself. So uh, something that I missed there, I'm, you know, he's going, oh, it's not contingent. Well, I don't know if he means the blackberry crum crumble now or the person doing it. But either way, you can't have a blackberry crumble without a person getting involved. Whereas a mechanical is simultaneous with its existence. Yeah. An example of that would be what? Yeah, but you don't know. Okay, no. okay, if you want to use that. Exactly. Yeah. Did yeah. You picked that up nicely. Yeah. Yeah. So I haven't heard that term before, but okay. Yeah. So, for example, if we look at things um, if, that have a conscious cause, basically what we know in the world, human beings, obviously, and animals, and to some extent, insects, they get to decide when to affect their cause. Yeah, I'm not so sure about insects. No, I know, I know. That's, that's to some degree. That's why I didn't say completely. Okay. No, okay. So now, we have to look at what things that began to exist. Now, you've accepted... Oh, wow. Okay, this this is where where the, the uh, this is where I want to start screaming. I don't know. The Christians came up with this like a thousand years ago, with this begin to exist, and I mean, it, it, it's stupid. Nothing begins to exist except maybe the universe, and that is it. Because everything else that we have today can be sourced to the beginning of the universe, and that's it. Correct. So he's equivocating on. Because we wouldn't say, uh, you know, uh, I created a, an apple crumble and it began to exist. That's not the language we'd normally use. So obviously we're talking philosophical language, but there is a mix up here between, because that's not, you know, that's, as you say, it's only the universe that would begin to exist in the sense that we normally would speak about it. Now, obviously, philosophers have split them up into creation ex nihilo and creation ex materia. But everything we've ever observed has always been, quote, creation ex materia. So that's, as you say, quite rightly what he's going to get to now or, or he's going to equivocate on those two in the moment well the, the problem is begin is, is a temporal thing so tell me when does a phone begin to exist so if anybody is listening to this just ask the guy when does a phone begin to exist when, when the last screw is put in or when 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 the guy starts building it or when the designer starts thinking about it or when the materials are purchased because just just think of it this way if you go and you say well it's when the when the phone is finished and it starts functioning as a phone that's when it begins to exist as a phone but the problem is if you take out the last screw does this phone now cease to exist and 
it, it, you, you can see immediately. I mean, if, if you go, I mean, if you, if you look at the puddle, I mean, it's always my favorite example. Um, if, if the puddle looks around and says, well, brilliant, you know, the whole world is, the whole universe is manufactured just for me to feel comfortable here in my hole in the, in the, in the road. If yeah. the puddle finds a hole in the road, is the first raindrop the beginning to exist of a puddle? Or does it take 50 raindrops? Or was it five past eight when the puddle started existing? Or is it when the dent in the road appeared? Or is it when the stone underneath the road collapsed to make a dent so that water could go and go fill this little hole in the road and become a puddle? And so on and so forth. Then you go back to the stone. When was that formed? And then that's why everything goes back to the universe. So exactly. It's, there is a there is a phil it's a philosophical quandary, isn't it, or paradox or something? Like you say, when does something actually begin to exist, and does it stop beginning the moment you take away a small part of it or whatever? Um, so, yes, and and it again sounds like splitting hairs, but the, the concept is important uh, because of the equivocation that they will get onto a bit later. Well, it has consequences, and this is the point. If you if you let it slip now, and you say, "Oh, yeah, sure, everything begins to exist." I mean, a book is not a book until you have the letters in the book. If you let that slide, and you say, "Oh, well, I agree with it," yeah, but then you're going to have later on, you're going to have the problems based on this assumption, which then are more difficult to to catch and and to argue if you let it slip in the beginning. This is why I always say, "No, no, no, make sure that you understand what you're doing in the beginning, and it pays off later on." Yeah. Yeah. And to exist. Not strictly speaking, but I'll give it to you. Let's let's go with it. Because, because Ruth says he's not sure whether the universe began to exist in the sense of like there was nothing, not nothing, but there was no universe and then there was suddenly yeah, okay. the universe. So, do you believe the universe is infinite or finite? As far as we know, finite. Therefore it began to exist? In some form, yes. It began to exist. So, so and we know now if something begins to exist, it requires a cause. Sure. So what do you then believe is the cause of that? So one plausible model that they give out is the quantum vacuum, which could be eternal. So that essentially is, and when I I say that to some people, they go, oh, that's like God. But of course, the quantum vacuum is not like God. It's not intelligent. It's not uh, conscious. It's just so, a so let's, let's field of possibility. Let's go with the, the, the quantum well, vacuum is not for nothing. It's not nothing. No, but no, I don't no. claim it was. So this quantum vacuum, uh, it's not conscious, no? No. no. Right. So it's mechanical. Random. I've never used the word mechanical. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why he keeps wanting to bring in the word mechanical. <laughs> it's, the, it's the primitive thinking. Because the painting requires a painter, it's mechanical. He, he has this thing in his back of his head, which everything needs a creator. So a yeah. creator creates, and that is mechanical. So a creator goes like this, and then he has matter, and then he throws the matter around, and then somehow creates the, the, the laws and, and, and all the boundaries. And then from this, he guides creation until it, you know, it gets to where we are today. But he doesn't understand. It's not an explanation. It's just the, the why, 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 but not the how. So this is a very useless um, thing that he's doing here. I don't understand even why he's doing that if he himself has, I'm sure, never been able to explain it. No, so they just use ontological arguments. In other words, what, what, what is it that caused this, but not the how, like you say. Um, but the problem is if you can't... Uh, justify that i can i can choose like i have here which is a plausible model it's it can be falsified that's the other good thing about it um and i don't claim that it is the case and in fact you know cosmologists basically say this is one you know one hypothesis out there but i can do that just as easily as they can posit the god and neither of us can demonstrate it's true the difference i think and actually I, I made a fault later on where i i allowed him to say it's a sort of stalemate actually it's not really a stalemate because no. um the quantum vacuum can be falsified and eventually we may actually find evidence of that uh, and one of the guys that comes around the speaker's corner uh, Carla who's been doing uh, cosmology is very certain that it comes from the quantum vacuum you know he's obviously learned more than I have but I wasn't prepared to say it's an absolute you know it's very very good I'm saying it's one hypothesis exactly yeah it's not conscious, let's just leave it at that. Right, so basically, it doesn't choose when to cause its effect. Random, random. Um, does it choose? No, no, uh, random would be a word, yeah. Random. Chance would be a word. Well, no, no, random. No, so, Rob, it doesn't have to be. There's always the alternative that it is contingent. In what sense? 
that it's it's a necessity. It has to. If certain conditions coincide, boof, there you go. You can't yes, and actually, you're right. You're absolutely right. It does. And I've, I've read a little bit about that with, with it. And I'll, I'll quote it now, actually. It's a good point you've made here. Here's, here's from page 94 of The Universe from Nothing from Lawrence Krauss. Yeah. If we are all stardust, as I have written, it is also true if inflation happened that we are all literally emerged from the quantum nothingness. So that's a quote from, from his book. Um, you're absolutely right. And in fact, he says, and I, it's somewhere here, and I'll, I'll come to it as well, is that if you have, you know, this quantum nothingness, something is guaranteed to come from there. So, yeah, yeah it, it, it will happen. That's exactly the point. And this scale. is, I think, beyond what, what um, good old Hamza can, can, well, I don't know. I've noticed that it's very difficult for, um, for Muslims in general to conceptualize. And or, or to think in abstract terms, they they always need this this foundation somehow, which is exactly this mechanical thing. And and I've noticed this with um, a, a lot of these from LDM, with the guys, apologists from LDM and from from my era. They go and they make arguments, and the ones if you are in a conversation, in other words, if they are not prefabricated, if they're not on a script, the things that they come up with are exactly like this. It's mechanical. It's it's got this this solid foundation. But it doesn't, you, you can't discuss concepts. I've then, also noticed that. Um, or they don't want to, whichever. So you're right. Um, I've noticed that as well, especially when I go into the asking about the universe from, from the nothing they talk about and then want to have that discussion. Um, yeah, they, they can't conceptualize that. Here's the, here's, the bit from, um, here's the bit that's relevant to this from page 140 of um, Lawrence Krauss's book. These quantum fluctuations imply something essential about the quantum world. Nothing will always produce something, if only for an instant. Yeah. And, so, and yeah, this is the whole point. And this is this is the the, the the book in a nutshell. And this is what they understand. What this nothing actually is. Because quantum mechanics or, or quantum physics is not something intuitive. It is not something that is easy to just pick up. You can't read and say, aha, is that how it works? It does not work like that. <laughs> no, the quantum world is very strange. <laughs> and we'll hear later on how he tries to use oh, that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's see. It's not random. It's, it's cause. It's, we're talking about the no, quantum we're, we're, No, we're talking about things that begin to exist. Yeah, We're talking about the cause of things that begin to exist. Okay, so on that point, what has ever begun to exist? So we've got to be quite clear because I... I what, what? Yes, yeah. I believe everything begins to exist. Okay, so that's not what most philosophers say. If you use the word begin to exist, what's ever only begin to exist? The universe is the only thing that's ever begun to exist. Would you agree? No, no everything exactly. else. Yeah, I forgot about this. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so I've said that now. And let's just, he will disagree, obviously. Let's just hear what he says about it. Has transformed from one from one. No, I begin to exist. No, no, you don't. Not in not in the same way the universe does. Prior to that, you were something else. Those atoms were in the universe. If you look this up. No, 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 no. no. Okay, so here I should have I should have di differentiated between creation ex materia and creation ex nihilo. I didn't do it. I was thinking about it, but the words didn't come to me in that moment. That would have potentially clarified this a little bit better. I doubt he's... it. I doubt <laughs> it. He is in this thing. This is what Craig also does. I mean, Craig says, "Who was I?" before I was born. You see, because he has this who was I. He doesn't understand that the particles that are used to assemble a human being are already there. There's nothing being created or generated. This is the thing. They don't, even Craig does not understand that. Yes, yeah, so it's a rearrangement of particles would be a better way of putting it. Yeah, I mean, look at the, the ancient Greeks had this, the, the, the Greek medicine. Um, when, when they had this homunculus who was being inserted into the womb and then, you know, nourished uh, the blood and, and the tissue and was feeding off the female. This is the, 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 the correct idea, that, that you already have the matter, the material available for the, well, the embryo at this stage um, to, to go and feed off from. There is nothing new that is being added to the universe. It's all there. Yes, correct. Yeah. No, it doesn't work like that. So if you're saying that the uh, the quantum, whatever it was, the quantum which, vacuum, which caused the universe, which is a possibility, is yeah. eternal, yeah. then its effect should be eternal. But it's not conscious. See, what, what I'm, yeah. I'm just 
you want to say something there? Well, like, no, I'm, I'm just saying, why, if, if the quantum vacuum is eternal, why should the effect of the quantum vacuum be eternal? Well, I think he doesn't know or understand that it that it can happen randomly and it will happen randomly, as Krauss and, and other cosmologists have talked about, that if you have this quantum field or quantum vacuum and you have quantum fluctuations, which are like waves that are going out, at some point, something will come from this, quote, nothingness. It's not the same nothingness they talk about, but it's it's the absence of space and time and particles, etc. And so that's what he's sort of not aware of. Yes. Sure. So its effect should be eternal. What, what do you mean by its effects? Well, if, if the quantum vacuum is the cause of the universe, yeah, yeah. And, yeah, and it's not conscious, that's what that means it's, its effect should be simultaneous with its existence. Uh, no, not necessarily. Why not? Why? Because the quantum field itself, according to the cosmologist, I'm not a cosmologist, is that it's random. So if you give it enough time, a universe will pop into existence and it'll be one with the properties that we see. Well, that can be proven. That's what. Well, no. Oh, of course, it can't be true. Right. Well, you believe this? No, I'm saying it's a possibility. Well, you believe it? That's what the oh, guys right. who are so, the top so, of the field right. are talking about. So, so now you're saying about this quantum. I, I want to bring up something here because this is something they do a lot, which is like you believe in this. Yeah. Um, it's it's, it's attempting to, to equate what what quote we believe with what they believe, uh, and uh, and this is. Um, either a little bit underhanded or they're just misinformed and that's something that I you know I'm when I hear that I, I'm not particularly impressed with them going oh well you believe this is almost like we're believing the same sort of metaphysical things that they are uh, and it's not in any way the same which I you know attempted to to say there because you get two things one is belief and one is knowledge and and they they mix the two of them up you know with knowledge it's either true or it's false it's either there's something or there isn't something with belief you've either got an acceptance of a proposition a rejection or i don't know so there's three options when you believe and I, and they confuse these two often yeah, and the i don't know is the one that they don't understand this is the, the funny thing they, they always say well there's only two options no it's not you, you also have the i don't know and the, you, you can have another option it's not that you believe in something or you believe something all you are stating is that it is a possibility and that's it whether you whether you now go and in, in invest in this or, or you think um, there's a 50 percent or 60 or 80 percent chance that's besides the point it's just a possibility and that's it correct uh, because knowledge as i was listening to recently knowledge is a subset of belief so yes. um, well, it's epistemology and the thing yeah. that you said um it's it's either correct or it's not correct the dichotomy is always correct or not correct, not correct or false. That's that's not the dichotomy. Yeah. Quantum idea. Yeah? Okay. And if, I'm not, if I'm not wrong, correct me. In quantum quantum mechanics. Uh, the, these these particles exist. Don't exist as particles. They exist as waves. Yeah. That's correct. Yes. One or the other. They can be both. Yeah, no. So no, they can be no. particles. Or they can only become particles when they're observed. No. 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 This is this is so bad. You know. This this, this sends shivers down my spine. No. He has no clue what he's talking about. He's just heard a couple of things. He repeats them, but doesn't know what he's talking about. It's, it's like what, what Shabir does. He, 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 he throws out a couple of words, making it sound as though he understands the, what is it, the subject matter. <laughs> and he, um, but in reality, he doesn't. And this shows the way that he is using this, the way he is using these expressions shows he has zero idea of what he's talking about. Yeah, and obviously he's going to, and this will go on for a little while yeah. here. Um, he's conflating, you know, what that famous double slit experiment and then wanting to say, oh, well, you know, because that's the way it works on the quantum level in that experiment, well, we had to have an observer for that to work on the quantum level in the in the universe, which, you know, I've multiple times sort of dismiss here. And the thing, I, I don't think, sorry, so just one thing. I don't think that he understands that we have an explanation for that. Because if, if you go into, I don't know if you're aware of this, this, this quantum um, field well, theory, I, I sort of theory, um, the, the model of a quantum field. If you go into that, then it's very, very obvious that as soon as you put an observer there, you are distorting the field as such. So you are then creating a force field around the observer, which then interacts with whatever you're shooting through there, with our particles, photons, what, whatever it is you're going through, shooting through the slit. Right, okay. Okay, cool.
Well, the first is in Sparrow. Yes, so that we, we can't extrapolate that to everything else. But we have to. Oh no, Occam's Razor. Well, well, let's, let's go to Occam's Razor then. Let's take things to its simplest form. Yeah. That's not what Occam's Razor says. No. Uh, okay, but Occam yeah, I would let it slide because you, I mean the, the concept I think is, is is correct. Yeah. If we look at no, but, hang on, but you you are much better at this. Can you explain what it is properly? So the basic, my basic understanding of, of Occam's razor is it's a it's a like a scientific slash philosophical principle that basically says don't multiply explanations unnecessarily. So if, if we can if we can understand something with three steps, then adding the fourth or the fifth step is irrelevant. And we we would and Occam's razor would deal with that and say the simplest explanation or multiple steps is the is the most probable. We don't need to add additional steps to it. Ah, you see, I forgot it's not about the that. simplest yeah. solution. It's it's multiplying uh, multiple uh, premises would be another word of putting it there. So multiple steps. You know, you want as little steps or premises as possible to explain something. Can it in the whole bunch of ways, and we know that they can only become particles once observed. Do we know that? Though? Well, we do from experiments. Yes. Mm, I'm not so sure that you can extrapolate. <laughs> So, if you've got just the experiment, <laughs> yeah, and, and you're shooting the particles through, and when you're not looking, or if you're filming it, 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 it goes through as a wave, yeah. but when you look at it, all of a sudden these waves become particles. Yes. Uh, which means, which is <laughs> that these bumps are going through the science, which is a little bit out. <laughs> let's, let, yeah, let's let this part run through, uh, otherwise we, we'll never get it done, um, and, and just say that I think there's some confusion here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is, we know now from this small example that quantum waves don't exist unless you observe them. They require an observer. They don't act as a as a as so a if you're matter. Using your quantum, as, as matter. quantum thing. As your, <laughs> that can't become material and particles unless that's observed according to quantum. No, that's that's absolutely that part. You know, is just. No. Yeah. Anyway, let's carry so on. I'm not according to the, to the cosmology. I'm not a cosmologist. I'm no, just no, saying no, no. to you, this is a plausible theory. That's a reflectable because if you believe that this universe was some quantum, this, that, the other, and it became the universe, yes. then according to the the, the, the teachings of um, quantum mechanics. <laughs> <that's just> <laughs> Go on, say something. You've got it. <laughs> the teachings of quantum mechanics. That is the best. <laughs> The teachings of light, or the teachings of the sun, tells us. <laughs> you never know; we might have a Bible of quantum mechanics one day. <laughs> oh goodness, this is. I mean, you know, <laughs> this reminds me of like like a five-year-old, which which says, "I think the spark plug elevation should be around fifty or so." You know, like. Like total nonsense, but it's quite cute if you hear us say it. But this is the teachings of quantum mechanics. Oh, yes, that's me. Yeah. So, but, but why are you rejecting are we, are we experts or are they experts? I, I don't know. No, but they're saying. Well, there's a couple of points there as well, actually. Yeah, of course. First of all, give the nuance. Now. First of all, they're not unanimously saying that. That's one. Oh, that's I... one. That's one theory. Okay. Secondly, well, this is again. This is one of these fallacies that these guys bring up, and in particular, Bass. You know, because not everybody in the entire scientific community agrees on every single point. They they all unanimously agree on the big topic, like inflationary model, almost all of them. But now he's going down to small things. And because some of them disagree, therefore, what? Exactly. Does the whole thing fall apart? Or just because not everybody agrees, suddenly we don't have the, I don't know, FMA suddenly breaks down or something? It's a pet peeve of mine, I think, where these guys are looking for certainty. And even if yeah. they did some philosophical work, and I've done very little, there's not a lot that we can say for certain, not about facts anyway. There's, there are some things that we can claim as certainty, but very little. And these guys are looking for certainty all the time, which is which is an illusion. And the moment you're not certain, oh, well, you know, then you can't say my one is wrong or you can't X, Y, and Z. Um, this, you know, this is a pet peeve of mine. Yeah, then there must be something wrong with it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Part of the reason that I don't like to actually get into these debates, and I have previously, but I've decided not to, is because really we're debating the unknown. <laughs> Do you know oh, your exact great. life purpose? Oh, I hate these. I'm going to show you three ways you can figure it out. Yeah, I wouldn't trust that guy. 
is because really we're debating the unknown. You don't know, Correct. and I don't know, other than God saying that I created it from nothing. From what he created... I've got a problem, so no, I'm no, 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 but, but what, what I'm trying to say to you yeah. is that, so, we're trying to quantify the unknown and deal with, at the moment, what are the best theories, but it's not analytical or empirical. Correct. So clearly we have to look at something else to see God. Actually... In God exists. Because to... Actually, that's not strictly true, is it? There are empirical models that can be produced. What what I guess I was thinking there is, no, we don't have empirical evidence before the beginning of the universe, but we have got empirical models and we've got a good understanding from the moment of the inflation, basically. So he's obviously, I'm taking it, I'm assuming he's talking about before the inflation or what happened before. But we have got empirical models that can test these sort of things. But isn't he also generalizing? Isn't he always saying that because we don't know everything about anything that's why we can't be certain about anything at all yeah but that's yeah and and yes and that's a pet argument as you say of, of other people in um speaker's corner that's fallacious anyway because using that logic then we would never we would never progress in anything or, or never exactly. yeah um yeah so the, the level of certainty that you need in order to say something is probably true um it depends on what it is, but we, we, no, we don't have to approach absolute certainty in, in order to say things are true. And the thing is that if we are speculating about the unknown, if we, if we now go and talk, well, let us talk about what is before the Big Bang, we don't. This is the whole point. Nobody speculates about it. We have different models, and whether they make sense or not, it's a different story. But at least you have arguments which support this. But with God, there's nothing. You don't have a single argument. You have absolutely nothing. It is something that is built out there on, on, on the wide open plain inside the desert. Um, now it's there. Now, now you have to say, well, it's there. Now you have to make some sense of it. No, it doesn't work. There is nothing that supports a God. And yet there are a lot of things which support all these way out models there are. Correct. They, they, at least, you know, there's more evidence pointing in that direction. Uh, and so, you know, they've got this ontological belief, but they've got no epistemology around it. So no how. And when you press them on the how, of course, then they resort to, oh, well, God just did this or God just did that. Well, that's not an explanation. That's exactly. just an that's assertion. The, point. the explanation yeah. point. I think this is one of the, the key words that people need to need to remember, that this is not an explanation. It's not a how. It just tells you, well, God did it. Yeah, and that's a thing for even for myself to remember and other people who are or having conversations. The moment you hear somebody make an assertion, ask them to justify it. Ask them, well, how did that happen? What, what can you say about this? Because um, just asserting it is is pointless. Yeah. I can just as well assert anything as well. That's not that's not how we come to understand things. To talk about what happened before the Big Bang, uh, you know, uh, on the quantum level of physics, how th matter and energy is transformed by the observer and the outcomes are changed. You know, we can talk about all of that and we can either extrapolate from that 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 must have happened or you can extrapolate from that. Well, I don't believe that it could have happened. You understand my point? Yes. It becomes a stalemate. So, what do we <laughs> look at? I believe. Yeah, I was too. I was too. God in there, and then if you can't do anything about it, it's a stalemate. Uh, yeah, yeah I was I was way too ready to accept the stalemate here. I've, I, I did sort of push back a bit later on, but I, sh I should have done it a bit more here. You know, um, but I think yeah. it's pretty obvious to anybody here now who's listening to this now with our running commentary that what he's saying is absolute total nonsense. It's abs it's, it's rubbish. Yeah, it's just assertions. There's no there's yeah. no justification here at all. Um, yeah. And of course, that's that's why you know he doesn't want to talk about these sort of things anymore. Because obviously, and, and one of the things I made note of here, the other reason he doesn't want to talk about these is because when somebody that that is an expert on it, like the guy called Phil, and I've got the link here and I've got the the details, wanted to explain this, he kept interrupting, and and it's like me speaking to a rocket scientist, and and he's explaining to me you know the science of how a rocket gets to the moon, and I'm interrupting, saying on a moment, well you know does it really get off the ground, and well don't you think the wind would do something, and just you know interrupting the guy all the time, so I don't actually get the explanation that's what he did with this other guy so of course he's not going to have an understanding of it creator sorry yeah it's not actually a stalemate because if i prove yes that quantum waves don't become particles unless observed yes that's not stalemate. No, no but what i'm saying of course of course he hasn't proven it he's asserted it and then you know it's like the fallacy of composition you know one a part of the whole you can't extrapolate that to the whole and if you can't explain it i'm right yeah or if you can't, well, if you can't um, 
if you can't what's the word um, refute it on the spot then then I've proven my point no well that's not how it works either <laughs> My standpoint is that a person could argue that, okay, fine, we see that with electrons fired through the double yeah. slit experiment, yeah. and that when an observer observes it, the wave collapses and it behaves as matter. It behaves as matter. So it's, right, so instead of getting an interference pattern of different, uh, you know, different waves or different lines on the, on the what's projected, we get the two lines and it acts just as matter. Yeah. Right? So but we could infer from that. Yeah, well, well, yes, I'm asking you, you could do. If you've Who was the observer that, at the Big Bang? Why reject the idea that that would happen on a large scale? Right, because yeah. there's no reason to assume that it works in every sense, in every way, like that, and particularly not before the universe. So you are, you're asking me to, to infer something that yes. is way beyond what I could possibly infer. You've done one experiment in one location, and now you want to infer right. further. Yeah, but, yeah, but even this quantum yeah, exactly. is theory. Yeah. What's that? Ex excellent. This is exactly, yeah. <laughs> you put the finger on it and, and twisting it, yeah. The quantum vacuum isn't theory, that part. Yes. Well, when I say theory, that's not theory in the sense. Well, well it, you, it, you know more about it. No, no, I don't really. Oh. But I mean, I know that they've done tests with, uh, for example, uh, the hydron collider and what have you, and they found particles. <laughs> but it doesn't change the, the topic. Which Do you know what? The more I listen to this, the more I think I, I, I just mustn't bring up the quantum theory, uh, the quantum vacuum. Um, because it's it's best just to say we don't know at present, um, yeah. which is something that a couple of the other commenters made in YouTube itself. That's the most honest shortcut version of this. Because as soon as I offer an explanation, then they want to nitpick the explanation. I don't have the scientific knowledge to give them every single answer and detail on this. And so then we sort of get off track here. So I think really I'm going to say, you know what, there are there are hypotheses out there. At the moment, nobody knows. That's the best answer that I can give. And you guys don't know either. You're just asserting it. Until I you can demonstrate you. it, Yeah. let's stop talking about it. I think but that's they, a very, very to... good idea. Very, very good point. Yes. Yeah, the only way that we advice. can talk about things is philosophically, and I do want to press them, and I'm going to do it again when I go back there, um, press them on this universe from nothing type thing. But that's a philosophical. It doesn't require quantum mechanics. It doesn't require anything else. We're just looking at the philosophical understanding of how did the universe come in. So that's a good learning for me. I'm just not going to go this route any, anymore, I don't think, because um, it, it just it doesn't help anyway and just prolongs the argument, really. Yeah. Is, does something come from nothing? That's the answer. That's the question. Okay, I, I, I notice Muslims do that a lot. Yes. Why do you assume I, I, that atheists think something comes from? I, I agree, and, and and so either you believe in an eternal form of matter, energy, particle, or whatever it might be, or you believe in an eternal God. But there has to be a. Or we don't know. That's the third option. And I'm gonna I'm gonna bring that in every single time now, just to. Because it's, it's not one or the other, like we've said before. Knowledge, you've got you know a yes or no to a knowledge, or it's true or not true. But with a belief, it's true. It's accept, reject, or I don't know. So he's you know got that wrong here. Yeah, exactly. Because what they don't understand is that you can go back and you can say, okay, then the universe was eternal. So why do you now want to, in, in, instead of the eternal universe, go and create an eternal God who creates a a, a finite universe. What is the point in doing that? There, I well, think what, what Sarah was saying, he's made a very good point. I can say energy is eternal. And if I just claim that, well, so what? Then it's the same claim as they make while well, the God exists, except I can say that energy exists. And then they come, well, then it's the same as God. No, it is not. That's the point that you were making, which I like very much. And that is, if you have energy which is eternal, and I could simply believe that energy is eternal, because that is then the cause of the universe, which was caused at some, some temporal point in time, but it doesn't have consciousness. It doesn't punish me if I don't believe it. Yes, the only, the only objection that would possibly come from that is something that Craig brought up as well, which is if something's eternal... Um, uh, how do at what point it should have started it should have the universe should have been eternal as well because why would it suddenly start happening at a temporal point whereas the quantum mechanics has an explanation for that so if we just posit that it's energy um, we have to explain or we have to think about well why did it happen 13.9 or 13.8 billion years ago as opposed to 20 billion or only 5 billion why no, that specific it happens point? all the time yeah but that's what quantum mechanics gives an explanation exactly. so I don't so exactly. I think we've got to be careful not to conflate potentially energy or quantum mechanics. Now maybe, yeah, maybe that's what I'm doing. Yeah, yeah. So maybe it's it's saying energy is quantum mechanics. But then I think yes. the other thing is you'd have to say, well, 
you know, the energy is, is underpins quantum mechanics in some sense, and and quantum no, mechanics it's a tells manifestation. us. Say again. It's a manifestation. Okay. And then, but then we'd, we'd have to explain why it happened at a certain point. I think that's the other thing that um, you can they, easily do, because then the, you have these interferences, and if at some stage they don't block each other, but there is some sort of interference which happens to multiply them, at that stage you have a universe, and this happens every fifteen milliseconds. Okay, so that's the sort of quantum mechanical effect of. Um, you know the quantum fluctuations essentially which is what Krauss talks about exactly and you can take um, this to extremes and then you're giving the label energy okay I mean yeah. you, you could do it that way yeah because they've they've got a very you know in their mind they've got a very plausible here's here's a contingent here's a um, a non-contingent being that decided to do this so they've got an answer for this you know whether it's true or not clearly but they've got an answer here's a conscious being and he decided to do it at x point we could always ask well why did he and, and Sarah sometimes does that. Well, why did he decide to do it at X points if he has no needs or wants or anything else? Why exactly did he do it 13.9 billion years yeah. ago, not before or after point. that? Yeah, yeah. Um, that's you know, a question for another time. By either one. Either the, either the universe or what created the universe is eternal, and that has to be a belief because it's not empirical, or what created it as the, from the religious point of view is eternal. One of the two. Now, so how do we distinguish... No. No, and it's, or we don't know. <laughs> yes, that would be the that would be the third option. So how? So he's going to ask a question here, which I didn't answer as well as I could. How do we distinguish? Well, we can produce scientific predictive models, and this is something that Shabir has fallen over with, and a lot of other people because they don't recognise that this is part of science. So you know, producing predictive models can predict, you know, and can be falsified with more data. Whether we can make predictions and go, okay, yes, this is going to work, or no, it doesn't, depending on the on the data that comes in. How do we do that for a God? How do we yeah. produce some kind of scientific prediction that will that will lead us to or away from God? Is my exactly. question. And that's that's the beauty of it. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Which one we believe to be eternal? Because they're not in, because it's not empirical. Well, you're not gonna see a photo of God, see a hand of God and say, I am God, believe in me. No true. Right. So the, 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 you have to come to that with reason and with the the best possible, let's say, reasoned arguments to support your claim. So for the Muslim, that would be the Quran. Okay, so how on earth is the Quran going to um, give us that answer? All it is is a claim. The book is a claim. It's not evidence. I don't know how many times these guys look at the Quran as if that's evidence. It's not evidence. It's a claim. I can bring the Book of Mormon or the Bible or whatever. You know, it is Bhagavad Gita, whatever it is. No, but it doesn't have these functions. It doesn't have this. It doesn't have that. This is it's OK. Let's, let's get to that later. Let's do it on, okay. the, on the one to one. And so when the Quran says, because at the time of the Arabs, when the Quran was revealed, that was the miracle. At the time of Moses, there were many miracles. He showed them staff turning into snake. You know, if you were standing at the time of Moses and the sea parted and you saw the sea on that side and you see the sea on this side, you would believe. You have no reason now to doubt. You'd say, well, yes, he is the prophet of God, right? No, you wouldn't. A proper skeptic would go, Am I? is my senses tricking me or not? You wouldn't just believe something. The first thing, you, if you were really skeptical, and people in those old days weren't, they believed a lot of, you know, strange things. Uh, first thing I do, am I, you know, am I conscious? I check my senses uh, before I, you know, I do a lot of investigation before I accepted something supernatural. I wouldn't just accept something. I'm much more likely that my... Yeah, my imagination is playing with me, then the laws of physics have been upended. Exactly. And it's a bait and switch because he's saying, well, it, the, the Quran is a miracle because if you take a miracle and this actually happened, then this is true. Therefore, the Quran is a miracle. Uh, no, it doesn't work that way. Yeah, you need, you need actual evidence. You can't just go, if that, if then type of thing. Give me something empirical, then, you know, then we can look back at the Quran. Yeah, and if something it, else is true, which we consider to be a miracle, has no bearing on the Quran. Yeah. And and even if there was even if the Quran correctly predicted one thing and we could em empirically verify it 99%, that doesn't mean everything else in the Quran is true. It may have got it right by accident, may have got it right it may have actually got it right correctly, but that doesn't mean that we need to trust everything else is in the book. That's the other leap that these guys make. Is oh well if if we could prove one thing, that must mean that most things, if not everything is true. That's again a mistake. Because 
this is not an illusion. I'm walking through the scene. But we don't see those miracles. So what is the miracle that we are left with that we can assess through a well-reasoned uh, investigative uh, way to ascertain whether this Quran could have indeed come from a man in the desert in the 7th century or was actually impossible for any human being to come up with. But that's a separate point from what happened. No, no, I understand. I, I, I understand. Because, no, because, because when we go into those arguments and I've studied... I don't mind. No, no, because I've, I've studied those arguments and discussions. And ultimately, even though Hamza came with a valid argument, which is that on the quantum level, we see energy acting as waves, but we only see it acting as matter when it's observed. So who was the observer when the universe exploded into pure energy? There had to be an observer to collapse the wave for it to act as matter. But you could then say to that, well, just because it happens there doesn't mean it would happen there. Correct. So we understand that. I right. Agree. Right. But, however, uh, never, Hamza but, but Hamza may, but if you look at it, it's not 50-50, because from what we can actually observe, Hamza, I would suggest, humbly, is perhaps more accurate in his assumption. Exactly the opposite. It's what we can observe, it's not necessarily the case. But yeah, so I, 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 I let this go 50-50, I shouldn't have accepted that at all because you can't bring a scientific model actually that counters that model you understand my point so what scientific but, model are you bringing sorry i'm talking about the observer collapsing the wave of, of, of pure energy at the big bang to make it act as matter right no but, no no I, I don't understand he, he you see this goes back to what you said earlier which is so true this mechanical this mechanics concept that's all they have he, we are not talking about a, tra a magic transformation between matter and wave. It's that a particle can have different properties. It's not that, you know, it's, 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 it's wearing a black hat and then once you observe it, it suddenly becomes a blue hat. No, it's just <laughs> the, the, the properties, the behavior is different. It's not, there's, no, there's no change in the particle. And this is what I think he doesn't understand. He thinks that if you put a, th a photon through there, and when you measure the photon, when you actually observe through which one it goes, that then it then it goes straight through or something, that this then means it's a different photon. It's not. It's the same thing. And this Correct. is the weird thing about quantum physics. You can't go and find an analogy in the normal world. You cannot do that. Yeah, agreed. It's it's using it. It's prop. But it, it, the, the the structure of the unit remains the same, but it it takes on a different. I don't know if I've even used the word property. It takes on a different um, action or some other word. You, you, you've got that spot on there, yeah. Because it happens on the quantum level and we observe it, doesn't mean it would happen on the universe. So what if you could, so you could present, I'm just sorry to interrupt again. So if you could present an experiment where you can show at the quantum level that the particle doesn't need to be observed, that's a stalemate. Yes. You have one experiment show. No, it's not. He's now shifting the burden of proof and saying, I need to produce something that shows the opposite of what we've already seen on the quantum level. Yeah. Uh, and what is that going to do? At best, that would show there's a stalemate on the quantum level in that small observation. So this is just a, a well, red herring. no explanation the at the moment. Yeah. You don't need the observer. Yes. There's an experiment saying you do need an observer. Yes. That's a stalemate. But right as we stand right now in quantum mechanics, you have one saying you require an observer and there's no competition for that. Yes. Well, we, well, we don't know that. We only know that. No, I, we can only know what we know when we do now. We can only know what we know now. We, know. we can only, You can only believe what you believe with regards to what you know now. I'm not asking you to have faith in the future. I'm talking about now. I'm not a cosmologist, but what I understand. But what CTV says, once you've established that there's an experiment at a quantum level that shows that uh, the, the wave can't become a part unless it's been observed, yeah? there's no reason to go against the idea that that would happen at the beginning of the universe. Yes, there is. Because that's what cosmologists are saying. They're literally saying that if you have their version of nothing, if you read the Krauss book, you know Krauss is universe books. from nothing. I've so heard what they're lectures, basically though. saying, he doesn't use nothing the way you guys that's do. That's right. But basically what he says is that if you have no space and no time, and you have the quantum vacuum, it's guaranteed that something must come into existence. That's what he says. Well, it's well, coming well, from the quantum well, vacuum. we know of the quantum vacuum, that we're talking about, it can't until it's been observed. No, but that's just... Oh. Not my assumption. Yeah, that's definitely his assumption. I've read it clearly from Krauss's book. No, There's you're doing no it perfect. There's no observer yeah. required. 
you know, I, I need to next time show him the book or quote this and go, hey, here's what the co cosmologists are saying. You don't require that in nowhere in his book does he talk about an observer. No observer is necessary. They don't talk about that. It's like you're just bringing this term up because you, you've seen it in, like you say, the double split experiment, and now you're trying to infer that elsewhere. No cosmologist talks about an observer. Okay, this tells you something about the the, the self perception problem that, that they have. I mean unbirth fulfillable. No, that is hilarious. Yeah, I mean on the on the on the universe thing, Hamza didn't do anything. I think Hamza learnt a few things there. No, uh, he didn't. Possibly, or maybe he didn't. You're right. No. I don't know. Come on. Yeah. I mean, the, the Professor Krauss wiped the floor with him there. I mean, Hamza went into hiding for a year. He went into a major crisis. I don't know how he survived it. He was gone for a year. Yes, you know more about that than I do, don't you? I just yeah. observed the debate. Like I said to you, um, you know, I don't think. Krauss argued a lot, which you talked about before, um, but obviously on cosmology, that's his specialty. And so, you know, other things, you know, maybe he's not an expert on, but on the cosmology, you know, he's, nobody's going to argue really there, or only other cosmologists. Yeah, and Hamza was stupid. I mean, uh, the thoughts is, Hamza, he, mm -hmm. he was stupid to go exactly into the field, which is Krauss's speciality, and then taunt him. That's That's... I don't know, that's suicide. The, the difficult thing, I think, from the members of the public, they don't understand it. So, you know, Krauss is doing his best to explain it, but to them it's it's like over their heads. And so, you know, it's, it's almost like you'd, we, we'll delete things we don't understand, which is a shame, really, because I've read the book about three or four times now, and it's an amazing story when you listen to how, you know, the universe came into being and how they measured, et cetera, et cetera. I know we're going a bit off, but this is related to, you know, this, this claim that they've just made here, which I think we can both agree certainly isn't the case, particularly on the on the cosmology part. Do, do you know Schrodinger's cat? I've heard of it. I've heard of it. Okay, it's, it's very simple. And and this, if, if you come up with it, just read up on it. I mean, it's, it's two seconds. And this is something that maybe will tell them that they don't have a proper grasp of what they're talking about. Um, it's it's a concept, okay? So if you put a cat in a box with a, with a, a, a lethal vial, the, the vial may or not be intact, which means that the cat can have two properties. It, and it can have both properties at the same time or neither one of them because it needs an observer to observe the cat whether it's dead or alive to establish which of the, the, the conditions that, which of the states it is in and there you have exactly the problem that a lot of people will not understand this they will say well we don't know what the property of the cat is when the dial when the vial is broken of course it's dead so it's, it's dead. So how can you say we don't know? Of course it's dead if this breaks. If you thump it, for example, it will be broken and the cat is dead. And then they don't understand that we do not know. And this is something that they will never be able to understand. Mm, yeah. Not your idea. I will, I will say, however, that I don't like Krauss's way of debating. He cuts people yes, off. He yes, did it with yeah, other people. Yeah. Uh, I'm not a fan of his way of yes. debating. I must be a fan of uh, what I'm saying right now, for me, I know you were saying it was a stalemate. I don't think it's a stalemate. I, I've got one experiment that's showing me this is the case. And you've got nothing to show the opposite. I, I, I bring you to you, the cosmologists, who are basically saying that if you have a quantum vacuum, yeah. that a universe will come into existence in a period of time. It's not as if... Well, Eternal. The, the quantum vacuum is, is eternal. Correct. Yeah. The universe will come into an existence at some point in time. That's what they say. I can't prove that. Can, I'm just giving you the latest can, can information. It, can it be eternal and then have, can it, is it, do you have the problem of the infinite regression? With no, an eternal no, no. quantum vacuum. I, I, by the way, I don't subscribe to you, uh, the infinite regression. Oh, you don't? No, no, no. So when an atheist comes and says, who created God? I don't believe in that. <laughs> That's one thing I want to point out. And maybe you can correct me or if other people have different views. Um, you know, when Richard Dawkins and other people talk about, oh, well, who created God? Um, if remember we're going into their worldview, you know, we can critique it from our worldview, which is fine. But if we're if we're looking at it from their worldview, which is what I do in these sort of things, I'm happy to accept that if there is sort of an all powerful or a immensely powerful being or whatever the case is, to me logically it would follow that it would have been eternal, because otherwise he would have had to come into existence at some point. And how would that have happened? 
and so you'd get into an infinite regress. So I'm not a I'm not a fan of anybody saying and, and maybe you know there's somebody can give me a reason why they feel that it is a good thing to to press the infinite regress or ask the question, well, who created God? I, to me, it doesn't seem like it's a, a useful question to to posit. Well, I, I think it's it's something that you state exactly what you've done now, where you say, okay, it doesn't make sense, it's useless, but I'm just going to accept it because it doesn't make sense talking about it because an infinite regress is there and you can accept it or not. So there's, there's nothing wrong with an infinite regress. It's, it's just one of these things that exist. Yeah, it's a possibility. You can't just pretend that it doesn't exist or you don't like it or it's yuck or something. No, you just have to go at exactly what you did. Matter of fact, yes, it's stupid. Yes, I accept it. Next point. Yeah. You've got a God that must be eternal. No, no, yeah. what do you mean by that? You, you don't believe in infinite regression? No, 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 no. Not, not, not for God. He's saying, but for, no, but, for, but, but, for, but, for, but for the quantum yeah. vacuum. Yeah. But for the quantum vacuum, he's saying it, it's eternal. Correct. It's just it, existing. In other, words, in other words, in other words, it, it's infinite history. It existed in infinite history. There's no oh, time. Oh, sorry. Limit. Beyond time. But is beyond it, is time. it not a series of events? No, but that's what I'm trying to say to you. That's a belief. Yeah. Correct. That's not science. No, no, no. Is it? Is it a series of events? Well, it is a belief because it's a vacuum. Well, no, no. The quantum vacuum being eternal is a belief. Is a I know, but it's not. It's not the practicalities of it. Is that a series of events? Well, according to the atheist who says that the quantum vacuum is eternal, he, effectively what he does is he takes God out of the equation and he puts a quantum vacuum there. Yeah. Yeah. That's what they're doing. I, I don't do that because. Yeah. I, but, that's, but the quantum well, vacuum. But the quantum vacuum is not conscious, which is my whole point. Exactly. Yeah. Well, well, why is the effect not come yeah. straight away? Just because it's a red. Okay, well, that's the point. Why does the effect not come straight? away or why does it not come and the explanation is because it'll happen at a random point and that's it consciousness otherwise, yeah yeah but what, what i hate here is the atheist will do this and this no the atheist does not and I, i'm stressing this every single time an atheist is only somebody who does not have a god belief the atheist can be anything he can believe in ghosts he can believe in i don't know what the atheist has nothing to do with the creation of the universe or the origin of the universe or the, the coming into being or the whatever. This is something that I hate if they do this. It has nothing to do with a God belief, yes or no. Yes, correct. Well, and I agree with you. And what they are positing is, oh, well, if you don't believe in a God, then these are the other consequences of you not believing in God. And in their world, they add this all together and then they say it in one in one breath like that. And, but I agree exactly. with you. It's so wrong. It is so wrong. And different atheists say different things anyway. So just that an atheist simply means, you know, a belief that there's no gods or non-belief in gods, whichever way you want to frame it. Um, but other than that, we could have vastly different beliefs on most other things. Most of it will be a naturalistic belief. Um, but it, they, they could, you know, vastly, they could be vastly different from each other. So it's no use just positing atheists as a, as a global label. And just, I came up with this example in, a, in, a, in one of my German videos. And this is something funny enough that people understand. Because if you ask a pilot whether he likes a schnitzel or not, it's not the pilot who's going to tell you whether he likes schnitzel or not, but the vegetarian in the pilot. <laughs> so it depends what kind of an outlook or approach or belief or whatever it is the pilot has which will answer. But then if you ask about the tire pressure of a, I don't know, Airbus 380, then it's not going to be the vegetarian. Then it's going to be the pilot who's, asked, who's answering the question. So you need to understand what it is that you're talking about. And just now telling an atheist, you must be a naturalist, you must be this, is stupid. Yeah. Just, just for interest's sake, um, my position currently is that I'm a. Um, uh, uh, it's not philosophical naturalism; it is um, methodological naturalism. So yes, that's yes, that, that's my position. I'm yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, I'll, I'll also go with that. Okay, but um, I hate these isms and ists and, and things like that. I like I don't have a worldview. I will maintain I do not have a worldview, and that's it. Cool. Okay. And they don't say closer a period of time. That's what they're saying. I'm not. I don't claim this, but I'm giving you a. a but, but that's my point. If you were, if you were, but you see, but you see, writing class or something, they would be able to explain. Sorry, I forgot. Like what was your name? Now? Rob, Rob, Abbas. Abbas, Rob, yeah, yeah. Rob, sorry, it's a Abbas. No, no, it's okay. Abbas. Rob, I always remember Rob, doing that. Rob, what it is, is that 
But that's why I don't like to go into these discussions. Sure, I'm not a scientist. Yeah. Neither are you. So shall we? Right. And, and and even the scientists themselves don't agree. Correct. So you have atheist scientists, agnostic, and in fact, as a scientist, you can never really be atheist. because you can only be atheist if you have had a, a time to experiment every possibility. Absolutely <laughs> bollocks. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's a non-belief in the metaphysical claim of your potentially imaginary God. That's it. I don't have to. I don't have to get rid of or you know disprove every other claim in the universe to just to not accept your claim. You've got to demonstrate your claim. I love the way that gets quickly swapped around here. Come up with a negative, then you can be an atheist. No, I don't agree. Well, there's two versions of atheism. Well, if, well, atheism is to believe that there is no creator. No, stop. Hang on. No, no, no. Atheism, number one, doesn't exist because there's no ism. There's, there's no goal. There's no action. There's no following. There's nothing. So no, that's number one. Number two, it is not believing something. The people need to understand that there is a difference between I believe there is no God or I don't believe that there is a God. And those are two fundamentally different statements and people need to learn this. Which is exactly, I think, what I'll say here now. Yeah, ah, absolutely. Okay. I don't remember this. Let's see if I do. So okay. there's two versions of atheism. Okay. One is called hard atheism, right? I don't agree with that. Say to you, there is definitely no God. Right. In which case, they have the burden of proof. Right. The weak atheist is my position that says okay. there's no good reasons or evidence to believe right. in a God, yes. but I don't dismiss it outright. Okay, so, 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 so it's not hard atheism then. Correct. So, so, so some people call it agnostic yeah, atheism. Fine. I don't like that term. I understand. But yeah. So, I, I don't okay, so there's the difference, isn't it? Um, which I, again, I was listening to somebody recently, and that sort of makes sense. Um, you're agnostic on the on the um, uh, the belief. No, you're agnostic no. on the knowledge, on the claim, on the knowledge. Yes, and then you're uh, atheist on the belief. Exactly. So there's the difference between belief and knowledge. So there is no knowledge. We cannot know. So this agnostic agnostic is a word we can simply ignore and delete from our vocabulary. It's useless. Yeah, I actually give the example further on, and and Hamza will answer it, but only after uh, a bus leaves. I think. Let's and, see. And I think with hard and soft and blah, no, if you do not make the claim that a god exists, you're atheist. That's how easy it is because you don't believe that a god exists. Whether you then say there is no god, is then a different aspect, a different facet, a different whatever in your personality. But the atheist only has one single thing, and that is the absence of a God belief. Cool. My, in my, this is me, okay? I appreciate, yeah. I appreciate that. It could be something. I just, yes, no I, I, I appreciate that. So what I'm trying to say to you is, as human beings today, living in the 21st century, what can we look at that convinces us that either the Muslims have got it right or they've got it wrong? That there is no God. Their, their, their view of God and how God came about, I don't believe it. I don't accept it. What, what would the reason for that be? Or I do accept it. What would the reasons for that be, right? Scientific method and good evidence would be two of the reasons, A, to, you know, for them to prove it, which obviously they haven't done. And I, what I suggest humbly is that we look at the Quran, because Allah says that this is a miracle. What is the Quran? The Quran itself. The, is, the Quran is a miracle. And those who read it and come to it with an open heart, with an open mind, Allah... Mm. No, you see, this is the whole point. If it were a miracle, it would not require an open heart or an open mind because then it would be persuasive no matter what your attitude was. Correct. So this whole open heart, open mind thing is really kind of to say, oh, well, if you don't believe it, then you haven't got an open heart and an open mind. So they set these criteria so it's easy to then fall back on if you go, well, you know, I've looked at it. Oh, well, you just didn't have an open heart and an open mind. Yeah. No bollocks. No, you don't set that criteria. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The truth. Now, those are bold claims. Sure right? Uh, uh, Rob, yes. can you just so what what would be a miraculous Quran? I would call it a miraculous Quran if it updated itself every year to represent reality of the year of the level of society and culture that we are experiencing at that moment in time in every language that we have. So that everybody would have their own personal copy of a Quran which would explain everything in detail to that one person 
convincing for that person. And that I would find a miracle. Yeah. Or for me, um, I, you know, I would find something a miracle if it, if it explained very clearly about the electricity or the germ theory of disease. No, or the fact that. that we, no, you know? this could be fluke. Yeah, but if it was very, if it was very um, clear on something, if it was like a Nostradamus type thing, and even he got most of them wrong. But if, it, and for me, even apart from what the claim is, you know, for a miracle, the more specific it is, the better there's a chance that it could be a miracle. The more um, vague it is, the less chance I'm, I'm uh, even going to entertain it. You mean if it says people in 1922 or uh, 1916 are going to find out E equals M C squared? Yeah, that sort of thing. So there will come, there will be a person that will happen in okay, exactly, right. you know, 1400 years time. And he will find out, he will use this complex equation that will explain to you how gravity affects, you know, the body, the heavenly bodies, etc. <clears throat> and there'll be a Jewish guy, your, your, your main enemy type thing. Now that I'd go, okay, that's something to look into. How would they have known that? So the, the more specific it is, you know, the better the chance it is that we can investigate it. The more vague it is, the less I'm even going to entertain it. And it's just too easy to make it fit, whatever you want to make it fit. And until then, you need to believe that a piece of steak will revive a corpse. Yes. I haven't got to that one yet. I've, I've got to find that still. Second chapter. Now, what is it that makes the Quran a miracle? Because a miracle is something that is beyond human capacity or human understanding, he, human ability. Yes. No. Miracle is something that's contrary to the natural order of things. It's not necessarily beyond human ability. You know, animals have things that are beyond human ability. We don't call that a miracle. So that's not my definition of a miracle. It's beyond that, right? Now, when I study people like, for example, Professor Raymond Farin, you can search for him. He teaches Arabic at the uh, American University in Kuwait. He spent 20, some 20 years studying poetry, uh, Arabic poetry, and then the Quran. Professor Raymond Farin, he converted to Islam. And he converted Islam because his understanding and his knowledge of the Quran over those years proved to him that this could not have come from any human being. And he wrote a book. I've got it with me. You can have a look at it. And he wrote a book. And as a consequence, he accepted Islam because of the fact that he claimed that this is a miracle. It's not from any human uh, source. So I would suggest humbly that we look at people like this, their claims, assess their claims, and then if we can come up with the, the Quran is very, the Quran is, uh, uh, you know, the Quran is very much, uh, you know, uh, like science in a way that it says, look, if it's wrong, then you come forward with an explanation as to where it's come from. The Quran, right? That this is a book from God. So, in other words, if there's and a mistake in no, there, no, no, no. you would accept it. No, 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 no. It and if it is not, and if it's not from God, then you come up with a reason as to where it has come from. <laughs> Go on then. Well, the, the number one thing is, if one guy says, "Oh, the Quran is beautiful," okay, what is the unit of beautiful? The second thing is, what happens if Al Razi, for example? mocked the Quran, mocked Muhammad, and said, you guys are crazy. You write a book which is in such a bad condition, which is so badly written, and then you come and you demand we produce something like it? Are you out of your tree? And that is what a guy said over a thousand years ago about the Quran. An Arab, ancient Arab-speaking guy. Yeah. So it's a shifting of the burden of proof. I've written something, you come up with something better. And by what criteria and who's going to judge whether it's better or not? Yeah, this is the, I mean, the surah like it. This is, uh, I've done entire videos on this showing exactly how stupid it is, how dishonest it is. And actually it's impossible <laughs> because at the end it says, you will never be able to do it. And if you do, you will go to hell. <laughs> Great, okay, so. You know, set up to fail. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so, so the burden of proof is now on me. Right. So, so not just proof. Well, because if, because if uh, if you release a paper, for example, in the in, in the in the journal, science paper, a theory, that theory then goes out, and then all the scientists of the world have an opportunity to poke 
at that right and if they're completely unable to do it then it's fine right. does, does it mean that, that the theory is then 100 percent true for human beings no so, so, so some, somebody can't prove something wrong does that automatically mean it's right if, if, if somebody can't prove it's wrong then it poses some logical and reasonable questions as to where it could have come from sure but that's not the now, same as now, claiming that it's but, absolutely well, right there's nothing there's nothing absolute with anything uh, because we're not absolute beings <laughs> excuse me what is your god absolutely everything come on <laughs> yes i was surprised that you didn't jump on him yet yeah i think he was he was um he was going oh we're fallible beings but there is an infallible god um yes we mm. could have gone down that route i guess i you know but at this sort of stage we got sidetracked here with with him bringing out this book and wanting to go into the you know the um the miracle of the quran itself which was not the the discussion i was having with hamza and you'll hear me later on say you know i almost fell asleep during this bit yeah. so yeah probably did miss quite a few things here it's a within us so the thing itself could be absolute because it's from god but our interpretation our spectacles that we look through uh, our predispositions of what we believe obviously will affect how we read and what we hear and and, and what we absorb right so I think to take away um, things that are subjective, I think we should look at things that are mechanical within the Quran, its structure, uh, how it was revealed, how it was recorded, and whether that could have actually occurred through any human understanding, knowledge, com uh, and ability. Whoa, stop, please. I mean, this is, he's, oh, this is where I would jump up and down, because what he is doing now, he's making it look as though there were knowledge what happened with the Quran. The truth is we do not know. We don't know where the Quran comes from. We don't know who wrote it. We don't know who compiled it. We don't know who sorted it. We don't know who changed, who added diacritical markings. We don't know anything about it. This is the truth. This is what we need. This is reality, okay? This is, the, I, I don't know why he makes it look like, like the, the revelation of the Quran over a time period of 23 years where sentences were sent down via angel or via telepathic commands or something and were automatically sorted into in the right order and this order is chaotic i mean you have like like this this inheritance thing where you have 411 412 now why does it then take the entire fourth chapter until it says well okay and your god is great and and everything and you need to obey him Oh, and by the way, the wife only inherits half. Uh, wh why is it that you get half of chapter, no, uh, th nine tenths of a chapter, because it takes from 4.11 to 4.176, the last sentence in chapter 4, before something is picked up that was started in chapter 4. You can't tell me that a divine being will cause so much chaos and at the same time, be so wrong when it comes to simple fractions in mathematics. I agree with you. And, and, and even not knowing the Quran, and I didn't get into it with, with him, but it would be a question that I'd ask another Muslim in the future if they bring up this whole Quran thing, is that it was revealed over 23 years, but the Quran is not even in, um, uh, in the proper order. Um, there's a term for it that just escapes me now. Um, you know, so... Who decided to have the the, the long Jumbled. verse first and the, and the other first? That's not the way it was it was relayed to Muhammad. So that for me is is a question in and of itself. So if you're telling me this book is wonderful, but it, it's not following the way in which or the chronological order in which it was um, dictated to Muhammad supposedly, what does that say? So some human decided to do it differently. So yeah, even you have chapter one. I mean, the first huh? chapter doesn't make sense at all. Yeah, I mean, I've just read the first chapter and it was, it was difficult for me to understand. It just sort of starts in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, but the, you know, if this is a God, how can a God say, honor your God, the most gracious, the most wonderful Lord of everything? Uh, this is me. This is me, God speaking. I, I cannot dictate a book which in the beginning says, honor your God. Then it would say, honor me. And not your God, who is this, who is this. Speaking of another God, as though this were a totally different God, a totally different Yeah, speaking third entity. person. Yeah. Well, not person, but entity, yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's not like the person is speaking of themselves. It's like somebody else is reporting it type of thing. Yes, and then it's only seven sentences, and it, it's, it's total gibberish. 
And then what, what happens is, then you start the Quran in chapter 2. And what is the first sentence in chapter 2, which is there to guide the people to salvation and to eternal bliss and everything? ALM. ALM. This is the first sentence in the Quran. ALM. There you go. Mm. This is a divine miracle. Please. And this is the book that I, I, I read and I love very much, Raymond Farin. There are other books as well about Quranic structure. He's not the first person to do it, in fact. So is that book about the, the structure of the Quran? About, about the grammatical structure of the Quran and the fact that for a human being yeah. or a group of human beings, it would have been impossible to have constructed the Quran in that way. How's, how would it have been impossible? The fact that he was it was revealed to him in 23 years and then put in a different order from the chrono chronological order, some human being could well have sat and done that or a bunch of human beings could have sat sure. and put it in that order. So, you know, if it was, you know, I, I would, it would be marginally, and I, I'm being very generous and charitable here, it'd be marginally more convincing if it was in fact exactly in the chronological order in which it was, it was revealed to Muhammad. But the fact that it isn't, that's a question mark for me. No doubt they'll have some answer as to why it's like that instead of being in the chronological order. Well, but that's a big question this, mark. Okay, this is, the, this is the problem here. The explanation that they have is it was revealed due to a certain historic event. So if there was a battle, where they had a lot of girls and they wanted to have sex with them, but they were married and they didn't really want to have sex with married girls, which is, well, Muslims are better than their God. But then this God said, no, 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 no. You don't need to worry. If they're married, it doesn't matter. You can have sex with them. You don't need to ask them. They are your booty. You captured them. You can have sex with them. Muhammad in several authentic hadith says the same thing as what is in the Quran in 424 you cannot get around this so they say okay it was the battle and da -da -da -da, and then to to make the the men happy then it was revealed that they were allowed to have sex with them now this is still in the Quran today so does that mean that parts of the Quran were only valid at the time that they were revealed or is it still valid today but if you go along this thing the whole Quran falls apart because then you have like sentences in the Hadith which say things which attach a certain sentence to a certain, well, incident in the past, which means the whole thing is only valid for that time and for those people who were there at the time. So the whole Quran is no longer valid today. So you can't have both ways, but you need to yeah. understand this. You need to know the, the, the whole big picture and understand what these people are doing to counter this. So this is just a pointer for those people who are still listening after what one and a half hours. Be, pay attention. You need to, in situations like this, and Rob is doing, I don't know how you manage this for 40 minutes, to actually go and, I oh know you fell asleep halfway, sorry, you took a nap. Because you need to pay attention to every word that somebody says, um, especially if it's like, a, like a, a snake in the grass, like Shabir. You need to pay attention to what is happening all the time. Yeah, and I, that's why I don't sort of have many Quranic dis discussions unless they bring up so-called science in the you know from the Quran but these sort of things I'm not in a position to to debate um, like you say and they'll have a version of that so I'm much more interested in the bigger what I consider more problematic things than getting yes. to, to the deepity of the Quran because you'd have to be a have a big interest in it already be a Muslim to go and start looking into the structure of the Quran that's never going to convince anybody and so we need to look at you know the bigger points first this is way further down the line yeah. and I think if I remember correctly he's not going to say well there's a structure to the second chapter because it starts here with this topic and then at the end it picks it up again and da, da, da. why would it do that if, if you if you say sentence number three has a topic why would you then sentence number seven should be so very similar sentence number four should be so very similar to sentence number six and so on and so forth which is not the case by the way like <laughs> i mean if you like i just said the first sentence of the quran is alm so does mla is, is that the last one no it's not so you know right off the bat you know that he's lying so what is the point mm. So, for example, some of the examples that he gives, you have concentric patterns and parallelism yeah. in the Quran. And it's it's the, for example, the Surah Baqarah, the second chapter of the Quran, it's 286 verses. This was revealed over 10 years with no editorial process. So it was yeah. all, of, all of a 
of a sudden the Prophet would get a revelation and he would say the revelation and the people would memorize that revelation immediately. So there was no writing down, hold on, I said that wrong, change that, no editorial process. We revealed the Quran over 23 years. Now what Raymond Farin argues is that to get these very complex patterns of structure, so for example, structure upon structure, ring upon ring of structure, and for it to conform in that way, it's impossible for any human being. It's just, it's like white noise. What ring upon ring and structure upon structure? No, this no, is no. arbitrary, they, they do completely that. arbitrary. No, Hamza Thorsus does this. Um, he, he once said that if you take the chapter two, he did this in one of his GDM shows, um, where it was not Hamza Thorsus, it was somebody else. Oh, uh, it was, yeah, yeah, I remember, it was a Scottish guy. Sorry, he wrote a book about this and he came up with this idea that um, the, the, the second chapter or other chapters in the Quran have this, what I just explained, there's something at the beginning, something at the end, something, you know, chapter three must correspond or somehow corresponds to chapter seven and so on. So it's, it's like a ring in the, um, that, like, like a, a tree ring and you have this in the Quran with the sentences. But that's bullshit. Just because it mentions the, you know, the Jews in, in the middle and then the Jews, then there's a break and then there's the Jews again. That, that's, that's all there is. So it's, it's really dumb to, to say something like this where anybody with even rudimentary knowledge of the Quran will immediately say, that's not true. Well, then fucking, pr oh, sorry, um, then, then fucking prove it to me. Bring, bring me an example. Show me something. And he will not be able to because he can't. Right, yeah. To have come up with that. Has anybody else has corroborated what he said? Uh, sure. other, authors, other things, and I think yes. Hamza's right. Yes. When we make a claim, and there's one yes. person who yes. can now be he, he, Yes, no, I agree. Uh, I, I, could be one, I totally agree with you. I totally, I, I totally, I totally, I totally, I totally agree with you. He actually lists, he actually lists many others. I mean, this would be uh, a study. So yes, of course. Going quite deep into this. Yes, the yes, yes, yes. Talk no, about the bigger. No, no, no. My argument here is this. So this is just one of many facets of evidence. Is one of them is the structure of the Quran. Then you have the grammatical miracle of the Quran. So, for example, when Allah refers to certain things, the shall we move on from this bit, or do you want to? Do you want yeah, to? I just, I just want to mention one last thing here. Yep. It is it is of vital importance if somebody comes up with a quote of a person, and this is something that sources teaches his people, bring as many people with as many quotes as possible. It is absolute nonsense, because nobody can say this guy wrote something based on this data with this interpretation and this is the source you can't do that so in Hyde Park to bring up something like this is ludicrous it's it's it, it's moronic to come up with some guy because you can't verify anything he can tell you whatever he wants just because some guy has an opinion about something you don't know how he came to that opinion what his data is so never ever as soon as somebody comes with a name or something tell them i'm not interested what other people say you need to bring the argument and that's it yeah exactly because you you can't you can't verify it somebody can make a claim it's much harder to refute uh okay so i'm going to just zoom forward here until after this bit here so let me you just get because i don't have a yeah and no, i've got a time code here where oh brilliant finish with oh, um with, all towards the end here but i want to i want to get this last little bit in of of that i thought was interesting here with with what abba said so just listen to this bit right in front of you and it takes away this subjective realm of i don't accept cutting off of your hand or marrying somebody of that age those are all subjective things if god said it's okay and you can prove that god said it then it's okay yeah that's it that that part there um, by the stage i was yeah i was obviously quite tired of listening to abbas going off there um, when he sort of got into the conversation but i mean that particular statement there is just as long as god said it and you can prove it it's okay is his view uh, if I see him again, I, I will definitely ask him about that. Let me, because I, you know, I say, oh, I watched this video. Do you stand by what you said? As long as God said it is, and we can prove it, how can we prove it? That's the other thing. Do we need to look in the Quran for its for its structure? Is that going to prove that God exists and that He said these things? Come on. Um, but if that is the case, then I'm afraid you're a moral monster. I, exactly. I I don't care if God existed or not. If you told me to, you know, have sex with a nine-year-old baby or cut off somebody's hands, I would refuse to do it. I don't care whether he said it or we can even prove that he said it. So I just I'll, I'll catch him on that next time. But I just wanted to catch those last little bit here. 
<laughs> yeah, this, is, this is the point that you, could, you can always say, do you criticize, do you categorically criticize other Muslims who stone a woman to death? And is, is he then going to say yes or no? Because if he says, well, yes, I do criticize this, then he's a bad Muslim. Well, especially going on the claim that he's just made there, which is, you know, if we can prove that God said it's, it's the case, um, then it's not subjective anymore, then we have to accept it. And presumably he accepts everything in the Quran. Yeah, and there's some being proof. Yeah. Yeah. There's some pretty unpleasant things that are going on in the Quran. So does he just accept that then? Even though we haven't proved it. It might have been proved in his mind, but the rest of us don't believe it. But does that mean that he accepts whatever's written? In other words, he follows the um divine command theory, yeah. which, you know, to me is utterly immoral. That's my point. I've got to quickly pray, I've got like two minutes. I'm really sorry. Uh, uh, Rob? I haven't actually, I just realized, I just looked at the sun, sorry. I just looked at the sun, and now I need to pray. Is he the sun god? I don't know, because obviously Hamza stayed there and he went to pray, you know, in about seven minutes or so, so I'm not sure how they decide when to pray. Is it like a personal thing, or, you know, is there specific times when people are supposed to pray? Yeah, it's, it's you have these different schools. You have the Hanbali, the Hanafi, the Shafi, and so on. So you have different people who at some point in time realize the shortfalls of the Quran and said, okay, I'm going to now set up the rules. And these are mundane things. Like, like if, if you pray the, the first um, position, like position numéro un, it's, it's like ballet, okay? So your position number one is when you stand up straight and then you put your right hand, it's always the right hand, over your left wrist, and then it depends now. Do you do this above your belly button, on your belly button, or below the belly button? Well, now different guys have decided, no, it must be above the belly button. If you put it below the belly button, then your God is not going to like you. You're not going to get your five points, and that is it, uh, your ten points, and that is it. And you're the one, it's your loss. Then the other guy says, no, 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 no. It's the opposite. It needs to be on the belly button. If you don't put it on the belly button, you don't get your ten points for the prayer. It's amazingly stupid, and people go along with it anyway. Yeah. Cool. I think the audio went bad here for a while. Oh, um, yeah, because he didn't have the microphone. What did he say to you? Is that? is that a recorder? What, no, what did he say? It's a mic. It's a Bluetooth mic. Well, there's a video. It's on video, so you don't worry. Well, right. So. Because I'm going private. You can. Well, what's he said? No, no, you're going to say something. I don't mind you saying. Even you listened a long time, then. I did. You could speak. Because that's where that's where I think you're very good. We had a conversation. He went into a monologue there about the the Quran and I. He's excited because he hasn't been to speak Quran for a while and he's been studying this. Yes, and mashallah, so very happy. I learned so much that it's unreal. Th that stuff there. That was for me. Yes, no, that's perfect. But that, that stuff needs to be interrogated by people who are experts in that field to begin with. So I, I personally don't have the info. No, no, what you can do though is go to experts in the field and see what they say about it. Correct, which I would do, and particularly the critics. I will look at what the, the people say and I look at the critics. But also, so, and also you, when the crit well, you have to also look at the critics because obviously there's bias. But there's bias both. <laughs> so I, I would suggest that there's more bias. Well, this guy wasn't a Muslim, and th th this is what he said to you initially. He wasn't. A, he basically, the guy wasn't a Muslim. He was an expert on poetry and all this, and then by studying Arabic poetry, he eventually got to the Quran, and then he realised that this Quran cannot just be Arabic poetry, and thus then he embraced Islam. Right, so, then, so basically, what's that? I just said. So what? Yeah, he, he realised that it could not have been from. No other than God, and he embraced it. How on earth did he come to that conclusion? Exactly. Uh, so and this what? is where it's a personal opinion. Well, correct. You know, and he, he's an expert. Has he has he got rid of all other p potential um, objections to it, or, yeah. or you know, has he discounted everything else? I think this is a you know, like you say, it's a subjective opinion. And just because he's an expert doesn't mean that he doesn't have cognitive bias or that he's. Um, he's going to more readily accept it than somebody else. He's already sort of half programmed into it already. So, you know, that's not impressive to me at all. The fact that somebody accepted something. I could find another linguist who would go, no ways. You know, exactly. I don't accept this in any sense. So, you know, that's not proof of anything. I mean, let's, let's face it. Would any Quran school, would any Islamic um, like, like cultural center allow me to hold a lecture on the Quran there? Never on your life. They would be poop scared. Come on, they, they're, they're so scared that somebody like me needs to be closed down on YouTube. That's, that's how desperate they are. 
if they were in any way convinced of what they are talking about, they would allow that because they would know, well, he can't do anything about it. But they don't. They don't allow that. He got, I mean, Tzotzis, for example, he went after professors whom he knew had no clue what the Quran is. Yes, it's much easier. So you can say what you like and you're not going to be refuted yeah. on the Quran. They'll have a particular expertise in some other field. He was like he was like you, um, but he was into the poetry of it. And then when he realised that this book can be from none other than God, he embraced it. Okay, you obviously haven't done that intellectual investigation. All right. So like I said to you right now. No, I said something earlier that you said you can't say. That. I said you don't know. And if you don't know, you can't say I'm wrong. <laughs> Yes, I can. It's obviously a fallacy. This just because I don't know doesn't mean I can't interrogate his ideas and find them. <sighs> I don't need to have an absolute idea myself. I can listen to something and go, you know, that's not plausible. It's not reasonable. Whatever the case may be, and not have an answer myself. And he can do the same. So it, it works both ways. I wonder if he listens to himself afterwards and goes, "Oh, I shouldn't have said that." <laughs> No, you can't say I'm wrong. I can't say you're absolutely wrong, but I don't. You, okay. That's my position. If you don't know, if you don't know... No, 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 no. Hang on. This is absolutely, totally, absolutely wrong. If I go and say, I do not know if human beings can fly, well then bloody well jump off the eighth floor and show me what happens. So even if I don't know, I can tell you, yes, you are wrong. I mean, that's, that's stupid. Even scientifically, I don't know, I still can say, yes, you're going to be wrong. Yeah, yeah, even if you don't know for certain one way or the other, and somebody gives you a claim, um, you know, there's no reason to believe it just because I don't know, you know, the, the absolute answer. Okay, so let me give you an... No, I don't agree with you. You don't? No, no. let me give you an... Listen to the example I give now. Tell me if I'm wrong in this position, Roman. If I say to you I have a dog at home, would you believe me? I've no reason not to. Correct. If I said to you I've got a three-headed dragon that breathes fire and that can fly at home, would you believe me? No. Would you Would you be agnostic on that position? Would you go, I don't know? Well, I, what? Would I say no? No. No. What would you be? What would be the I, 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 I would say, do you have evidence to support this idea? Right. Thank you. That's exactly the same for me. So that's my go-to argument that I use now. So when people bring up this thing, is it reasonable to accept that I've got a, a dragon at home? Are you going to be agnostic and say, I don't know? Or are you going to take the more reasonable position and say, There's, I'll, I'll reject that claim unless you can produce evidence because it's an extraordinary claim. And that's the other bit we didn't talk about, which is the level of claim as well. So you've got knowledge and belief, but you've also got the level of the claim. If it's a benign claim, hey, I saw Mary yesterday. I'm not, there's no reason for me to doubt you. So there's, I'm likely to accept that. If you say I've got a, dra a dragon at home, I'm going to reject that because that's an extraordinary claim. And so you've got to bring the evidence. Or and if you know that Mary died three years ago. Exactly. Or if you've got a, if you've got a claim midway between that somewhere where you're making some kind of a claim, um, I might go, well, I don't know about that. But the more extraordinary the claim, the less likely I am to, I'm going to reject it. So the less likely I am to accept it. So that's the, the third part of the, the puzzle here. And that's mm. what I was explaining to him but here. But it's good that other people do because I came up with this. Okay, my, my grade, and this I, I've used this for five or six years. Number one, I've got a Toyota in the garage. Number two, I've got a Bugatti Veyron in the garage. Number three, I've got a fire-spitting, breathing dragon in the garage. Those are the three state grades that I used to have. Yeah, yeah. So I'd probably accept the first one if it was a, a smaller car. The other one, I'd go, oh, I don't know, because I don't know you. I don't know if you're a millionaire or not. And then with the dragon, I'd go, no, I reject that until okay. you bring the evidence. Yeah, yeah. Right. So I'm not in the position where I say I don't know in that in the same example. I say it's unreasonable to believe in a God unless we can demonstrate. What's the dragon? No. So I'm not agnostic. So what is it? Okay, what is it unreasonable about a conscious uncaused cause? Because we don't have reasons or evidence to believe. What's unreasonable about it? The fact that we don't have good reasons. Well, we, we, well the fact is that anything. You're claiming something that is extraordinary. No, no. I'm claiming something that uh, follows the laws of quantum mechanics. Oh, no. I have this down here. Yes, follows the laws of quantum mechanics. I, I did write that one down here. I'm mm. not sure where he came up with that. What's it got to do with quantum mechanics? I'm guessing in his mind he's going, oh, well, because there was an observer and therefore, th you know, even if you've got quantum mechanics, God can be observing it. That must, that's the only thing I can think of as to why he would have said that. I can't think of anything that makes it plausible.
<laughs> well, okay, I'm being charitable then, I guess. That, uh, you assert it does, that's the difference. You can't prove it, you, you're just asserting it. So it fits into everything when you, because you say it does. We need more than that. Yeah. Because I could say Zeus does the same thing. So now you have God, we have Zeus. Yes. That's another thing. Say again? I, I'm not, I haven't mentioned God. Yeah, but that's what you're talking about. No, <laughs> Rob. I start this conversation with you. Never once mentioned religion. Never once mentioned Quran. Never once mentioned God. But you keep jumping on this God thing. I ain't mentioned it. All I've done is science, 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 science. Quantum mechanics, cause and effect. That's all I've done. Stephen Hawking, Big Bang. I'm, I'm on that. I'm with Aristotle, Plato, and uh, Stephen Hawking right now. You've said to me that it's true. I can't say that. What, what was your? What was the exact words you used about your view of the beginning? I, I, I'm, I'm saying if you don't know let's say you don't know how it began yes and i say it began with a uncaused cause conscious yes. okay oh, and of course that's got nothing to do with god that could that's be anything couldn't it of course not yeah. Because you don't know, yes. you can't say my understanding is wrong. I don't say it's wrong, I say it's unreasonable to believe until there's good right, right, right. reason. Right, right, right. All right. Now, I think it's reasonable to believe that. Why? Yeah. Okay. One, everything that begins to exist requires a cause. <laughs> Two, the universe began to exist. Three, therefore, requires a cause. He didn't even quite get that right, but close enough. That's the <laughs> cosmological argument. So we've got back to that. Um, so the fact that he hasn't used the word God, it's all inferred there. Um, and unfortunately, he came to speak to me. Had it been another atheist that never heard this, they would have, you know, so I knew immediately what he's talking about here. So I want to just stop beating around the bush and make it as if it's it sounds so reasonable. You're trying to bring up an argument to, you know, show that God is the most likely explanation for the universe. Yeah. But 10 out of 10 for picking it up and for staying awake here. <laughs> and there's a lot of problems with the Kalam cosmological argument. Why? Number one, the, the, the well, first premise. It's good though, because I want to test this out. Yeah, exactly. The first premise. What's the first premise? Okay, so everything that begins to exist. What is everything? What is has everything? Has he tested everything? The, the first word, everything, is already wrong. You can already throw it out. But everything can only mean everything within this universe, isn't it? Well, anything else that, we don't know. well, has he has he looked at everything in the universe? No, we only know four percent of what there is. So, how the hell does he come up with everything? Yeah, good point. He's inferring it um, across the entire universe. That doesn't matter. So, the first word already. Thanks. Bye. Out. Mm. How many things have begun? To do, you, do you agree with that? Yes. And how many things have begun to exist? I explained earlier. One thing. Just no, for you know. No, nothing I, else has begun to exist. I, I said it, I disagree okay, with so it. That's My where, apple crumble in the in the oven began to exist. You're using the word incorrectly. What, 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 you keep putting Lawrence Krauss. Uh, no, sorry, uh, William. I don't know why they cut it here. I don't know what happened here. They've just cut the video because their bus is back here again. It's a, it's so a now, different camera. I think you ran out of battery. All oh, right. Craig or me and <laughs> I'm not saying this stuff. Right, say it again. Say the three. You have to, you've been to speaker's corner too long. <laughs> no, I know them. That's why. But you gave me the three of them. What was the first? No, one? no. Well, all I said was simple. Everything that begins to exist has a cause. You then started messing around with the word begin. Yes. Right. Does it apply to the universe? Then you said. Then I said, did my apple crumble begin to exist? Then you started saying, oh, it just transformed from one thing to another. I have no issue with that. But it couldn't transform from one thing to another without a cause. Me. Yeah. Right. What you're saying? Now I'm taking it to the, the greater level, the universe that had a cause it needed a cause to go from one thing to another yeah and I'm from one thing to another. From this quantum vacuum singularity, whatever it was. Now you take on my personal view. Why would you do that? Why aren't you taking on your, your view of how the universe came into being? Because that's what the... I'm going to science. Right? I'm going to science, mate. I told you. I started this whole conversation. Never once mentioned God. I know. Never once mentioned religion. Never used any of the Quran to support my ideas. I'm just talking science, mate. I'm just going what Aristotle said or Plato Nothing said. Nothing out of the Quran, of course. Yeah. The whole so, thing, it's exactly the opposite. Everything is based on the Quran. Everything is based on God. And nothing is based on knowledge, thinking, or education. It's sheer ignorance, indoctrination from the Quran. And that's it. Yeah, sometimes they want to come across as being very um, intellectual and, and non-religious and try and step away from the Quran, which obviously is something Shabir attempts to do as well, to make it sound more plausible. But they're, they're working from an inference of a God in the back of their mind at all times. 
what Hawking says, and what Einstein says, and what Hubble says. I'm just going up these guys. I'm not making, I'm not going on a religious tangent here. Yeah, I'm just being, telling you that model. So looking at that model, for me, being, it's reasonable to assume there must be a cause. And that cause needs to be conscious. Rob, I have to go pray. Been a pleasure. We'll catch up again, buddy. Yeah, we always escape at mud with time because this yeah, place descends into chaos. All oh, right, that's so Okay, that's it. Yeah. Okay, and this is the whole point. This is, it, it, there are so many different things here which shows how ridiculously simple the minds work that bring this together. This is why I chose this video because there are so many things. It uses the Quran, it uses the Kalam, it uses all these different fallacies, it all uses all these, these false claims and, and it, it's I mean, there's everything in this video. It's the bait and switch. It's it's the, it's the strawman. It's the red herrings. It's um, from 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 argument from authority. There is everything in this video that makes Muslim apologetics so utterly ridiculous. It's it. I mean, I'm more entertained. I mean, I laugh more about this video than anything. If I would have been there, I would have been furious. But it's, it's useless. It's useless, useless, useless. I don't know why they do this. Yeah, and, and when I look at it, um, you know, I put aside whatever, you know, because as I, as you quite rightly said, you know, a lot of the claims are spurious. There's no um, evidence to support it, or there's logical fallacies thrown in. So there's a lot of that happening. But I often look at what could I do differently, because you know, for me, that's the that's the learning point. I'm not going to be able to change those guys. They're going to come with their same views every single time, and I'm going to go, okay, so what can I learn? How can I have better information to discuss this in a, in a better way next time? Um, because ultimately these videos go out um, and you know I just if, if somebody comes to me and goes and a couple of people have actually um, but somebody goes gee you know that helped me in some way even if it's a small thing that that's useful to me and I'm yeah. not telling them to to be a Muslim or not to be a Muslim but I'm just hoping that through these discussions in some way people will um, you know think about things more critically and, and make a better informed decision I think that would be useful so if you take an analysis, what would your suggestion be for others? Uh, you mean viewers or people? Viewers. So I, I would, whenever I do this, I would ask them to go and look critically at it, especially at the big big arguments. The whole This whole video was really about the Kalam cosmological argument. So if you went to go and investigate that, I've been looking into it more recently. As it happens, there was a 270-page book written by Craig, who's the, the main proponent of this just on that first premise so this is not as simple an argument as people think it is uh, and I've got some videos that I'm studying at the moment with the counter arguments it's not quite as straightforward as it sounds at, at a higher level you know on a street level we can dismiss it but if we really want to be more um, informed then we need to go and look into this because this is a this is a big argument that obviously Muslims have originated then Craig took it over. Now Muslims are grabbing it back and taking Craig's version again. And this goes back to the heart of everything. Whenever I talk to guys, they always go back to the beginning of the universe. Well, how did the universe come into being if it, if there was no God? This is the first thing I hear from most Muslims. Mm. So go and study up on this particular thing from a philosophical and a scientific point of view and get more information. And that's what I'm sort of doing at the moment. Uh, and it's a journey. It'll, it'll take me months, if not years, probably to, to be really absolutely know it inside out. And if I can throw in just one piece of advice here, stick to a single topic. Mm -hmm. Don't let anybody go sidetrack you. Don't let anybody go off on a tangent. Don't let them go, oh, but, but by the way, what about this? What about this? Because a lot of times what I find is that if they find that you are critical and you've, you've caught them on something, they will quickly divert and go on to something else. Don't allow that. First, finish it. First, make them accept here it is wrong. Good advice, yeah. Good way to finish. And of course, if you want to know anything about the Kalam cosmological argument, I've debunked it a couple of times. I think one is actually on my blog. Brilliant. Okay, so that's somewhere people oh, can look as well. There's, there's others I'm, who've done it. I mean, there's if you're a bit of a, you know, if you like the sort of philosophical side to it as well, then um, there's a guy called um, Theoretical Bullshit that's done quite a few, and I've downloaded them actually, and I'm going through them because he's a young guy, but he's he's pretty hot on. Um, the philosophy of this particular argument and Craig won't debate him and he's you know and it's it's gone sort of sideways but it's it, it's interesting from that point of view how he goes through it he really dives into it and I think that that's useful as well if people want to get a better understanding of it but remember he rambles on and on yeah yeah 
Cool. Thank you so okay. much. For no, this was fun. I mean, it's, it's but thank you that you skipped over this because it's true. If you go one word at a time, uh, which I tend to do, uh, then then I mean, look, we spent two hours now talking about just you know a couple of minutes on a video. I think there's another one that I'd like to do with you, which is much shorter. That one we can go sentence by sentence, um, and it's an older video that I already started to do, and it, it might be interesting for the two of us to do that. It's it's probably about seven to ten minutes, and I think you know I think perhaps if we're going to do more of these, let's keep it a sort of ten fifteen minutes because then we can dive into Agreed. more of it, and it doesn't take as long to get through. But yeah. it's a great first video to do like this. At least we've we've kind of seen that it can work. Let's just make it a shorter version of this. And what I like very much is that your approach is very different to mine, and yet sometimes we arrive at the same conclusion and sometimes we don't. So this is quite yeah. interesting. Yes, and you can bring a perspective that I can learn something from because I don't yeah. know it all by any stretch, and so I've got a particular approach. You'll come and say, oh, Rob, you could have done this and that, and I go, okay, great. I'll incorporate that next time I have an argument with somebody, yeah. And what I've learned from you is to take everything with a bit of a um, more laid-back uh, approach and look at the philosophical side and don't just go on the word-by-word -word thing which is the debating side. And then maybe we could talk about this, this other, the street of epistemology way of doing things which is completely laid back and completely away from this debating thing and, and emotional or emotionally loaded um, discussions the way that I have them. Okay, that's my data. <laughs> Brilliant. Thanks, Rob. Talk to you next time.